So welcome, welcome everyone to um, today's Tuesday morning online panel discussion. The topic is how can institutional investors benefit from crypto assets and also maybe what's, what's holding back that development. Um, discussing today is Philip Zatner as the moderator from the Frankfurt School Blockchain Center, Jan from 21E6, Maximilian from Digital Exchange Börse Stuttgart, Christian from Blockchain Capital, and Thomas Schmiedel from Rubenstein and Schmiedel. Because as always, there's going to be an interactive part as well. If you have any um, questions that you want to ask the participants or the panelists, then you can just post them in this group and Philip and I will monitor it, the speakers hopefully as well, and then can then react to it. Also, the speakers are in this group, so if, if there are questions that cannot be um, added to the panel because of time constraints, that's not a problem. Um, we, we always hope to carry on the conversation after the event is over. And um, if you cannot scan this QR code for whatever reason, the link to the WhatsApp group is also in the email you'll receive from Eventbrite. So there's the Zoom link and below is the, the WhatsApp link. That's it from my side. Um, I'm Jan from Disrupt and I'll now hand over to Philip. Thanks for joining. Thank you, Jan, for these uh, very kind introduction words. Um, let me quickly present the panel. Um, we have today here Jan Spörer from uh, 26 or 21 million. You need to let us know how you want to be uh, spelling the company name. Then we have Max here from uh, Börse Stuttgart Digital Exchange. Then Christian Labetsch from Block Size Capital and also Thomas Schmiedel uh, from RNS. Um, 21 million, uh, 21E6 is sponsoring this event. Therefore, I would like uh, to uh, give um, you, Jan, quickly the possibility to present uh, some slides. Um, and afterwards, everybody should quickly present himself and also the opinion on this topic in general. And afterwards, we will start with all the questions. Would this be fine? Because then, Jan, I'm handing over to you directly. Yeah, sure. Thank you. <laughs> okay, unmuting works already. Happy about that. Now let's see if I can also share my screen. Mm. Yes, great. Okay, we all pretend to be tech experts, but sometimes these th little things are the hardest. <laughs> yeah, all right. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I was a participant in these Disrupt Networks a couple of times already. Now I'm happy to also be a panel uh, member this time. Um, I hope it's going to be interesting. Um, yeah, uh, let me first tell, tell you maybe three sentences uh, as a summary of what we're doing. And then I give you a little more detail. It's just going to be like three main slides. Don't worry too much. It's not going to take a, take a lot of time. Um, so what are we doing in, in like a couple sentences? Uh, so we are basically a broker between the sell side and the buy side. So we uh, connect providers um, like uh, crypto funds with uh, investors, like family offices. And we um, receive a commission from the sell side for this. So this is what we're doing. Um, uh, can you see the screen fully? Uh, probably not because. Uh, okay. No, you can hide the. You can hide the thumbnail. <laughs> Sorry for this. Okay, now it should be better. Yeah, see, this is what I mean. <laughs> okay, yeah, so our aim is to give institutional investors access to this new asset class. Um, we have seen that a lot of retail investors already invested into crypto, and now we really would like to drive this push um, toward uh, institutional investors getting in. And we want to uh, enable crypto like institutional investors that are already maybe invested a little bit or that haven't invested at all to professionalize their crypto investments and to pr find the right providers that can serve their needs best. So what is our uh, hypothesis? Our hypothesis is that this is today's asset allocation that an exemplary family office, for example, may have. Uh, family offices may be invest heavily invested into stocks and bonds, uh, some alternative investments like private equity and venture capital, and also uh, commodities and uh, cash. If they now just uh, add 
a small portion of crypto of between 1.5 and 2.5% of their assets under management, this is already going to be a huge, uh, like huge potential. Um, I opened this Visual Capitalist. Can you see this actually? The website yeah. of Visual Capitalist? Yeah. Is it shared? Yeah. I, I opened this um, because this also shows uh, how much money there is in the world. Maybe you know this um, website already and this particular visualization. Uh, Bitcoin is still pretty small and cryptocurrency in total is still pretty small if you compare it to all of these things. I'm not gonna go over this now. Um, but I think this, th this is showing that they're just from the, from the sheer size um, of assets that are out there in the world, there is still a lot of potential and we believe if, institutional investors just put in a little bit of their money into crypto, this is already gonna have a huge impact on the market. So our offer is that we provide a legally compliant um, offer in terms of uh, taxes and regulation. Uh, we are trustworthy. This of course you have to decide for yourself. Uh, we are transparent. So we tell you that we receive some sort of kickback from our um, investors in a sense, and we don't make a secret about this. Um, we had a lot of discussions about how we want to handle this, like how we want to earn money. But um, at the end, we decided that this is the, the best way of doing that. And yeah, we help you to enter this next uh, big asset class. Some words uh, to our team, I'm not going to introduce everyone individually. I'm just going to introduce myself mainly. Mm, so I'm more of a junior uh, team member. I uh, am responsible for business development and especially for uh, the sell side screening, sell side due diligence. Um, I have some weird finance and tech background, some mix between those two. Um, I was also at uh, Frankfurt School in my master's, so I know Philip, obviously. Um, and actually, the funny thing is, I think in some way, um, 21 million has a connection to all of you guys. So I, I, because I was just thinking about this to Max, you can see that uh, Johannes is affiliated with Börse Stuttgart, uh, to Christian, because I was freelancing for, for you guys at BlockSize, to Thomas, because we have already had some talks um, to onboard you as a sell side uh, provider, and to Jan, the host of this, um, of, yeah, from the disrupt side, um, he was a fellow student of mine when I was studying. So yeah, it's quite interesting how small the crypto world is. Yeah, and that's already it. Mm, just a couple words, like we are based in Switzerland. We decided this is kind of the most straightforward and easy uh, thing for us to do um, for several reasons. And we think this also has uh, yeah, benefits for many investors. Um, many investors are also based in Switzerland and even for German investors, it's no problem to work with a Swiss company on these things. So yeah, if you want to reach out to us, then please do so. Um, if I'm not the right person to talk to you with your particular matter, then I will forward your inquiry. Uh, and I'm going to send those slides around later so you don't need to get your phone and scan this QR card now. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. That's it from my side. Uh, I'm gonna stop sharing so another person can. Perfect. So, so you have uh, presented yourself and the company uh, quickly. Uh, you are sponsoring this event, therefore um, uh, this was a more lengthy introduction, right? Um, who wants to be next? Maybe Max uh, Christian, who wants to quickly present himself and uh, his company? Max, you want to start? Sure, sure I can go. <laughs> so uh, Max von Wallenberg, I'm the uh, CEO of uh, Börse Stuttgart Digital Exchange. It's a pretty self-explanatory name. We're the uh, uh, crypto exchange of uh, Börse Stuttgart. And um, we have seen a lot of inbound interest by institutional investors. Um, so we decided to um, launch a dedicated B2B institutional crypto trading offering. Um, the biggest problem we see in the market in uh, specifically Germany and the Dach region is like the lack of like a trusted trading partner for institutional trading um, in digital assets. So uh, with Börse Stuttgart, uh, we can offer that. We are, uh, you know, we're, we're regulated to the highest standards um, and we are uh, fully made in Germany um, with uh, custody and trading all under one roof. Um, we use Solaris Bank as our banking partner, and yeah, we look forward to uh, working 
with uh, any institutions, but also retail traders, of course, that would like to use our offering. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak. Excellent. Um, Christian, do you want to quickly present yourself and your company? Yeah, sure. Thanks. <clears throat> Hey, good morning. Thanks for having me. Um, Block Size Capital is an infrastructure provider that allows especially financial institutions to get into the crypto trading business. So what does that mean? That basically means that um, a lot of broker dealers, for example, see increasing demand from institutional investors, but they lack infrastructure that allows them to split orders, for example, across multiple exchanges. Uh, split liquidity um, across those uh, trading venues and then facilitate the entire post-trade settlement process. That means get in, for example, the bought Bitcoin from the exchange into the buyer's um, custody uh, account. And this is exactly what our software does. So um, this offer is actually tailored for uh, financial institutions, regulated financial institutions that mainly serve institutional investors. Excellent. And then finally, we have uh, Thomas here from uh, Rubinstein and Schmiedel. Uh, you also want to present yourself. I think it's a fascinating uh, crypto fund, uh, by the way, even though uh, the company name wouldn't um, allow us to expect this. Okay. Um, yeah, sure. Thanks for the intro. So my name is Thomas Schmiedel. I'm from Rubinstein and Schmiedel. And uh, we're a company based in uh, Switzerland and Germany. And we put strong focus on... Um, algorithmic trading and artificial intelligence. And we manage basically uh, strongly diversified portfolios in cryptocurrencies for our clients. And uh, we do this by, um, by having basically every part of the pipeline from end to end basically automated. And we use artificial intelligence basically whenever possible and where it helps the decision process. And um, the main benefit basically um, where we see us is taking volatility out of crypto portfolios because many investors basically want to participate in the market, but um, the volatility might be initial. So um, we have ways basically to take the volatility out of this using our uh, handcrafted algorithms basically. That's what we do. So you are basically an full-fledged uh, crypto fund, right? Uh, with, an, uh, with a legal entity in Switzerland. In, 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 in Liechtenstein, to be, uh, to be exact. And uh, we're a prop trading company, uh, private placement, and we manage investors' capital. Okay, excellent. So let's get started. So the, the first question would be, uh, I think that's a very trivial one. Um, do you, which, which domains do you now see rising? I think this is pretty clear. That's crypto assets, digital securities, and these days also decentralized finance, you know, like according to the media and the numbers, these areas are uh, increasing, but concerning institutional investors, um, which of these domains are mainly interesting for institutionals, right? Because uh, apparently um, DeFi, decentralized finance is on the rise, uh, but um, I would guess so that uh, institutional investors uh, would not invest there because of this it's too early, infrastructure is not there, regulation is unclear, and so on. Would you confirm this or put it differently? Which assets are interesting for institutional investors? Who wants to start with this question? Maybe, maybe Max, you would like to start? Yeah, I was just going to raise my hand. <laughs> um, yeah, interest, interestingly enough, like the uh, institutional trading space very much focuses on Bitcoin at the moment. Like it's the most liquid asset. Um, and in our opinion, uh, you know, if you, if you offer like the, you know, or if you get institutions to trade like the top three or four assets by market cap, that's already a massive win. Um, and then it's naturally, a, you know, a new asset class for institutional traders to jump into. So they do require, you know, uh, I would say a more established brand name currency to trade in. Um, I think when it comes to like more like full on full fledged crypto funds, I think we have to like, like distinguish a bit between what institutional investors are. On the one hand, you have like, you know, the large players like banks, investment banks and you know, like the, the, that bring substantial size to the market and they are more interested in like the, you know, the, the bigger cap coins. But if you look at like the smaller, like crypto only funds, they're also happy to trade more exotic uh, products that are, you know, allow for arbitrage or other opportunities there, you know, you know, even uh, allowing for algo trading, that's actually still quite profitable in, in these, uh, you know, second tier markets. But for like the big brand name, big capital institutional trading customers, 
we see the main interest in like, you know, the very liquid uh, products. And to your question regarding DeFi, uh, I think there's a lot of buzz around it. I think yesterday I read that Uniswap uh, eclipsed Coinbase Pro in terms of trading volume uh, for the first time. That was yesterday, which is quite significant, um, but it's a bit of a craze at the moment. And um, uh, in my opinion, quite a hype. It'll, it'll come eventually, but um, it's not something where I at the moment see institutional interests, you know, with significant staying power going into. If, uh, one, one question additionally to this, if you talk about institutional investors, yeah. uh, who is this? Is this privately held money by um, one-man legal entities, you know, like classical uh, one-man asset management companies? Is it basically more formal asset managers? Is it family offices? Or is it uh, some uh, Bitcoin rich uh, people? You know, what, what is an institutional investor in your mind, Alex? Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, it's all of the above, <laughs> but uh, like the big size comes, I would say by like the, you know, if you look at like trading volumes, it's sort of your, your full crypto funds that maybe manage between, you know, 50 to like $200 million, right? And they, would, they do, they trade a lot. They generate a lot of volume. Um, when it comes to like the family offices and like, you know, your, your, your traditional investors, they allocate more, like they allocate money to crypto assets, but they're not driving significant volume. Um, and like your individuals, um, yes, they're, you know, they, they are going into the market, but I wouldn't necessarily classify them as institutionals, even though, you know, they can be, there can be Bitcoin whales that drive, you know, significant capital to the market, but like, I wouldn't really classify them as institutions. Okay, interesting. So what about the others? Uh, would you agree that uh, at this point of time, um, DeFi, for example, is creating a lot of buzz? Um, securities tokens um, work somehow for regulatory reasons, but the interest mainly goes towards Bitcoin and uh, Ethereum, right? Um, who wants to also answer on this question? Maybe, maybe Christian, would you like to add something? Yeah, so I, I can totally confirm that. Uh, but also I have to say, um, as Max pointed out, it really depends on, um, on the assets under management in a specific fund. Just imagine the situation that you're a big fund and you have a 50 million USD position of Bitcoin in your portfolio and you want to get out. That's simply not really um, a, a, an easy thing to do, right? Because you have to wait for the liquidity to appear on the secondary markets. Um, and uh, you're exposing yourself to a specific risk that you only can eliminate that position with significant slippage um, uh, and also a market impact even. Um, so, I mean, for big funds, it's very simple. Um, if you need a liquid asset class you want to invest in, it's only Bitcoin at the moment, okay? Um, but for smaller funds, we see clearly an appetite for um, DeFi tokens, for more exotic tokens. Um, but they also only have a volume of one or two million um, assets under management. And for them holding 10 positions, um, the relative size of each position is, is comparably small. So they can actually allow trading less liquid tokens. On the other side also, of course, those tokens attract the investors because they generated just outrageous um, returns, whether this is justifiable or not, that, that is a different question. But uh, whenever you see those returns, you see a lot of um, investors actually um, buying into that hype. Um, so DeFi is a topic. Um, we see an appetite in trading link, compound, um, and other tokens of, um, of that category. Um, however, only in small volume. Um, so yeah, I totally confirm that trend. It's mainly Bitcoin USD, Bitcoin Euro even, um, and we don't um, see a lot of Bitcoin, other cryptocurrency pairs. It's mainly fiat crypto uh, or fiat Bitcoin to, pre, to be precise. Okay, excellent. Um, and uh, uh, Thomas, um, is it the same with you? People are investing in your fund uh, because it's not a Bitcoin fund, right? Because it's mm -hmm. a over fund, uh, I would say. So, um, so what, are, what kind of investors do you have? Is it also people investing in Bitcoin wanting to diversify or what kind of people is it? Okay, so basically our clients, um, okay, let's make an example. So we had the Corona panic basically also in crypto markets. And what we saw there was that the major trading pairs like Bitcoin, but also Ethereum and so on, uh, they had a lot of volatility as well. And um, like drops up to 50%, 60, whatever exchange you look at. And um, basically our clients are people who want to participate in cryptocurrencies and also the potential growth, but are um, 
well, rightfully so, um, a bit, you know, scared of volatility spikes like this. So what we do is um, we have another approach. We strongly diversify using algorithms. So um, about 300 to 500 uh, trading pairs, actually, to be honest, where depending on volume, assets are distributed to, which takes a lot of, you know, um, excitement, let, let me say like downward excitement out of the markets, but uh, we still capture a large part of the upside. Basically, that's the motivation of people coming to us. Okay, so you are a crypto fund. How large is the fund at this point of time? Is it growing? Is it shrinking? And most important, um, now that the entire market uh, grew in the last couple of months very strongly or weeks, uh, we grew in, with Ethereum, we grew from 180 to Uh, now 430 US dollar, that's uh, basic, basically plus 100 percent. Did your algorithms also detect this in time, you know, like before, the, before this uprise? Or um, have you been market neutral um, because your algorithms didn't detect this very strong uprise? So what, what happened with your AI? Mm -hmm. Okay, so basically interest is growing, fund capital is growing. That's uh, for your first question. But um, even more interesting, um, when basically, I think four weeks back, uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum had this uh, breakout, uh, we saw that the AI algorithm actually bought two days before the spike, um, which was very nice because it confirmed, of course, um, that the system, you know, handles uh, breakout scenarios quite well. And um, that's what it did. I mean, when we look at drawdown or let's say that when we look at risk adjusted return we see that um, we had on like the major trading pairs um, when we group them together and compare buy and hold basically strategy of Bitcoin Ethereum but also Ripple and uh, some other major uh, large cap coins basically then they had kind of a corona drawdown of 50 percent um, we would have done uh, six And on the upside, basically, we capture still 75% of the upside. So risk reward, we're you know, um, ahead of a buy and hold portfolio. And that's what basically our clients you know, um, are interested in and participating, but only having a limited downside risk. Yeah, and, and you are a mathematician and computer scientist, so you know what you're talking about. You're not a businessman uh, uh, reading out some numbers uh, which has been produced by some analytics people, right? So you know it yourself, you have computed it yourself, so um, I think this needs to be emphasized. So, uh, okay, because, and how large is the fund again? I missed this answer. It's uh, basically, it's like a larger seven-figure amount and uh, we're... Okay, so basically largest seven figure amount and to your first uh, question, basically I have a background in uh, machine learning, big data and data science. I was responsible for a uh, AI uh, consulting company um, before and we basically were implementing for banks and insurance companies uh, AI solutions. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Could I, Philip, could I ask a quick question uh, regarding yes. this? So. Uh, I read that about 30% of tra like of trading volume in um, in crypto at the moment is algorithmic trading uh, or powered by algorithms. Thomas, do you know this number or like do you have any more insight about that? Like and whether it's actually good for the market, especially for retail traders, or you know, uh, you know, what's what's the verdict uh, on this one? How, what is the share you would expect to be algorithmic trading, Max? 30%, three zero. Three zero. Okay, Thomas, would you confirm this? Yes, so um, it depends a bit how you group. So we have like two categories. So we have basically market making, market making bots, like on a lot of cryptocurrency, cur cryptocurrency exchanges. I'm sorry, you have a lot of market making bo bots being active, but also you have like trading systems uh, the way we do that actually create buy and sell signals. And uh, depending on how you count this, like 30% is a quite realistic number. And uh, depending on effect on retail traders. So one thing is actually there's a lot of um, um, benefit actually to this for uh, retail investors. If you look at market making, uh, mar market making strategies, um, 
you will see that they of course like they provide liquidity for retail investors or when they want to buy they have the ability to buy that's a good thing um also um there's using signal providers there's also like a way to you know benefit for retail investors and to participate um but what we also see is that um there are only a few entities on the market actually which uh, focus or that concentrate uh, a lot of knowledge in the you know in the quant and the ai field basically um, where it is already difficult for retail investors to keep up that's interesting so you see uh, people getting more professional every day and at the same time the, the, the normal asset manager the normal retail investor is not keeping up with this knowledge. So this should then lead to some kind of divergence, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's um, at first, basically, when you only have a few AI or quant enabled, basically funds or uh, um, large, well, basically investors, whales, whatever you like to name them uh, in the market, you have the issue that uh, there's this divergence between retail investors and let's say, uh, institutional investors that uh, can use funds that basically use AI, for example. Um, but the second step, I think, will be at some point like algorithms trading against algorithms. And then we will maybe see what we already see in the high frequency trading department, where you get basically um, a lot of competition depending who is the fastest, who is the quickest, who can you know afford the quickest data center and the quickest connection to the exchange. It's one part, but also, and that's basically where we want to compete. Uh, you will see that you will have a lot of you know uh, races, race, or like races basically depending on knowledge and uh, AI. You will have um, competition, especially who's building the smartest machines. You, Remember maybe like uh, AlphaGo, nobody thought it was possible to beat, you know, uh, people, um, a computer to, to beat people playing Go. But it was, Google did it and or DeepMind did it in 2016. And you will see um, a lot of evolution basically on, on also on the algorithm side. Okay, very interesting. Um, uh, Christian, do, can you confirm this share of 30% um, being traded algorithmically or via some kind of um, robots or bots? I, I can't really say what the exact amount is um, because those patterns, they are not um, necessarily obvious. What I can confirm though is that those bots, market making bots in particular, um, it could also be a bad thing, especially for institutional investors, because something that we see is, I mean, just imagine how an informed institutional investor uh, makes a decision. Um, how does an institutional investor pick basically an exchange to trade on? By the order book depth, right? Because that institutional investors want to get executed for the best price and also access um, a great pool of liquidity. So for a few exchanges, we in particular see when we analyze the order books that a lot of the volume consists of limit orders being canceled all the time. So what does that suggest? It suggests that the order book depth is significant, right? In order to, I guess, attract institutional investors, but we see those limit orders sitting in the order book and then getting canceled all the time, right? And not even executed. And this is something that we clearly see, especially um, on a few exchanges. I don't know whether this is common practice on um, a lot of exchanges, at least for some it's very obvious and for some it isn't. So still you can see that there, there's huge difference in, in how professional exchanges actually treat order book depth and their reporting and, 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 and reporting trading volume on that exchange. And I think this is a bias and this bias could really lead to quite expensive um, decisions on the institutional side when not carefully actually making a due diligence on order book depths, real liquidity on the exchanges and understanding what's currently happening there in the order book. Yeah, I think this is a really important uh, point that you mentioned here. And we see this as well uh, with, uh, I would say, com competing exchanges. I don't want to call them competitors because like they are really based in locations where as an institutional trader, you don't want to trade. Because um, there's no concept of, in Germany, it's called um, a Marktüberwachung, which is basically, a, you know, supervisory of, uh, what, what's the exact translation? Like a supervisory of the trading order book, right? And we have this with um, 
DWWB, um, which is our uh, regulatory, um, uh, basically our, you know, our, our partner on the regulatory side in-house. That's the, uh, um, uh, the fact that like no one in crypto really, there's no transparency. And we see this on, on many exchanges, even big brand name ones that they're doing everything to blow up order books. There's a lot of wash trading happening. And this is something that, in my opinion, is, is one of the biggest problem in, in, in crypto trading, that we don't have a, you know, a, a standard set of rules that applies to everyone. And um, that's precisely the reason why we at Börse Stuttgart believe like a brand name exchange in a regulated market, a strictly regulated market like Germany is, is absolutely required to make this a, a big asset class for institutions to trade. Well, and it's... I and it's, and the owner of um, Bitcoin DE is trying to sell his company. Maybe that's a result of your market entry. <laughs> Could be, or uh, or there are greedy motives involved. We don't know, right? <laughs> but <clears throat> even to add something, Max, it's even worse. I mean, it's not only just um, fake limit orders in the order book. We do have clients that, that actually don't want to enter any limit orders to those exchanges, right? Um, and you can call them paranoid, but however, we our platform, we have to support synthetic limit orders that only sit in our system and then will be executed as market because they have experience that a limit order sitting in the order book, right, will be just fetched out of the order book. And, and this is something which is clearly uh, probably the, the biggest signal that should um, ring all alarm bells that you have with those exchanges. And I believe also, exactly as you said, it's a lack of regulation. They can do whatever they want. Um, mm. Yeah. Okay. I think it's also a lack of, 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 of transparency and, and data here, right? You don't really have a, you know, a, a regulatory body, yes, but you also don't have like, you know, analytics. So if I, as a, as a person, want to really find out what trading volumes are or re real trading volumes on exchanges, like, I mean, you, you coin market cap is useless for that, right? Like, I mean, there's just a lot of, you know, fake information out there and um, it'll take some time. But in my opinion, like it'll, uh, especially once big money enters the stage, like the, the, the standards will be raised. So, um, uh, yeah. Yeah, but this, this is exactly uh, something I don't understand. You know, some people are saying uh, ex uh, like the, the trading fee of 1.5% or something like this, 2%, is too high, the market is inefficient, and uh, in fact, in by mathematics, it's 0.5% uh, too high, this Bitcoin price. But at the end of the day, you know, it's risky anyway, plus uh, we have a strong upside potential for Bitcoin, so why should I care be because of 1%, you know? Why, why should I care? Why should I, why should I care of the quality of coin market cap? It's sufficiently high, given the strong upside potential of Bitcoin. So why should I care, Max? Uh, this is something I really don't understand. Yeah. Many people are explaining this to me and also many uh, great and successful investors from legacy financial markets are uh, uh, tell me, ah, we cannot really invest in crypto assets. Uh, the markets are not there. It's not efficient. Uh, the fee structure are too high and so on. But um, if you really like go deep into, into this argument, then these people apparently have not, understand, have not understood the upside potential because there's an upside potential of times five times three in terms of the Bitcoin price, why should I care of 1%? I should rather care about getting in as soon as possible, right? Um, well, I mean, I think what you mentioned now is sort of the retail uh, investor perspective, right? Like I, as a retail investor, don't really mind if I pay 2% commission. Well, technically I should, right? But like, you know, uh, smart retail investors uh, don't uh, trade for these high commissions because uh, it's possible to trade for like 0. 3% uh, um, uh, or 0.35 percent like it's currently on, on, on our exchange. But um, for institutional investors, it matters a lot. It not, you know, the, the, the fees matter a lot, but also the quality of exchange and also like the, the actual volumes that are being traded in, in a currency. And what I mentioned, if you go to CoinMarketCap and look at the actual volumes that are being traded of individual um, tokens and coins, like there, most of it is fake. I mean, there's other sites like um, Nomics, Dot com, which do a much better job of kind of going a bit more into like the quality of the exchange and the quality of volume. But in my opinion, you know, the, the, the quality of data that we see with regards to trading is not nearly where it should be if you compare to the, um, the, the traditional markets. But to your point, um, Philip, like as a retail investor, yeah, I mean, I agree. Like, I mean, if you invest in a very volatile asset class with an upside potential of three to five X, or, you know, as the Winklevoss brothers said, it's 50x or 45x apparently from here, like, you know, 1% shouldn't really matter. 
um, to you. But uh, as an institutional, it matters a lot. Okay, that's a, that's a good good answer. Okay, one, one more question to you, Max. Um, we, saw, we actually saw a very strong uprise in the last weeks, um, and now some people are saying Bitcoin has become too expensive, they would not invest now, right? Mm -hmm. Do you agree with them, or what are you telling these people? Uh, I don't agree. Um, I mean, if you if you just look at the amount of like the amount of money or the percentage of wealth that's currently invested in in this asset class, it's absolutely tiny. It's you know it's it's almost insignificant if you compare it to like the uh, the, the potential that's in the market. So um, you know if you look at like why do people buy gold, for example, or you know they buy it as a diversifier. Right. And in my opinion, there, you know, to the, the presentation that Jan gave in the beginning of the of the talk, like I think there's massive upside potential. You know, the question is more like how long it will take. Um, but there is a lack of of asset classes, in my opinion. And, you know, crypto is one of them. Commodities, one of them. Equities, bonds. But in my opinion, like people are chasing yield. Right. Like, I mean, you have negative interest rates, like people need to invest their money. So. People are looking for actively looking for for asset classes to invest in, and uh, if if crypto only takes one to two percent of that uh, interest, like we're looking at at that you know thirty to fifty x um, that um, that's being thrown around. I mean, I don't know when, but like it's my strong strong opinion that we'll get there. Okay, Chris, Christian, would you confirm uh, or or otherwise uh, or put the question differently? Is Bitcoin already too expensive, and it is Ethereum too expensive? Yeah, because it would not be the case uh, in case uh, we believe in like 10x. Yeah, kind of a philosophical question, right? Um, <laughs> it, it, it's funny. I mean, according to Warren Buffett, Bitcoin has no value at all, no inherent value at all, um, and it really depends on the perspective. Okay, so basically, Bitcoin has the value that we are placing in it or that we determine it to be. And given the current um, fiscal policy that we, that we see in the unprecedented amount of debt being, being in the system, um, I think there's a high chance that people at some point in time start mistrusting the system. Um, and also the Fed, I, I mean, amounting to keep the inflation rate moderately um, above 2%, not including inflated stock prices. Um, in that is also a signal that could scare a lot of people. And then um, I'd like to think of Bitcoin as the maybe digital gold or commodity of the 21st century, mm -hmm. a store of value, so to say, um, with a, a very appealing factor that um, compared to that very inflationary fiscal policy or money policy that we see, that, the, that we actually have a deflationary um, algorithm, right, limiting the amount of Bitcoin circulating in the system. And I think this could be um, quite a very appealing alternative uh, to currently, in my opinion, um, inflationary priced assets on the market. Um, and I think this is interesting. What the true value is, I don't know. The value is basically what people are willing to pay for it. And that's, I think that's for clear, although it's not really uh, saying a lot, but um, I don't know. I, I believe there's a potential for Bitcoin to rise. Uh, that depends on a lot of factors, though. Absolutely. Well, why we are talking here now since the last 40 minutes, Bitcoin rose by 1.5% and Ethereum rose by 3% uh, just in these 40 minutes. But uh, that's an artifact, of course, uh, uh, right? Uh, but, but maybe next question uh, to you, Jan. Um, What's, what's your opinion here? In case there is such a strong upside potential uh, with Bitcoin, in case this is, right, then what would you recommend? Uh, why, why would you recommend still maybe one and another crypto fund? Uh, would you recommend uh, purchasing Bitcoin right away? Would you recommend uh, institutionals going to a broker's company? So what would you recommend? Yeah, so overall, I can definitely confirm what uh, Max said about um, it is already good if uh, yeah, in, institutionals start investing into the biggest asset, like the three or four biggest assets and get um, going there. Then also what uh, Christian said, it should, of course, all be done with proper custody, uh, custody and a settlement. So everything should be uh, safe and uh, sound. And um, then to take also uh, Thomas uh, into the whole equation, um, this whole um, 
price action topic that you see in, in Bitcoin um, is still pretty big, I think. So even though there are a lot of uh, institutional, like a lot of uh, algo traders out there, at least um, from what I have read and also from some analyses uh, that I did on, on Bitcoin data and some other uh, crypto data, it is still possible to get valuable act um, information just from price action. So just from, um, from past prices in crypto, you uh, can you can change your portfolio allocation um, accordingly and try to minimize volatility, try to minimize drawdown and all of that. And I think this is what institutional investors um, should should focus on. Yeah, should focus on the, the largest uh, assets, uh, make sure that everything is like that custody is, yeah, is being done well. And then um, I believe that uh, this is gonna be a good, a good way of in investing for institutional Okay, so uh, do you investors. propose basically if I now uh, term this differently, you would propose that an investor who would uh, like to take a long position should and could simply purchase Bitcoin. But in case the investor or asset manager does not want to take a long position, but rather wants to be market neutral, then especially the crypto area delivers uh, mm -hmm. a couple of um, um, risk optimized arbitrage opportunities, uh, which also provide mm -hmm. some return uh, with a market neutral position, right? Would you yeah, uh, yes, market neutral may be hard because it is still hard to, um, or not that common to really short uh, cryptocurrencies. It's not so easy at the moment and not so cheap at the moment as on equity markets. So really being a crypto hedge fund these days is uh, still not easy. So being really market neutral is um, easy easily said easy and not uh, yeah and hardly done kind of but yeah you, you can definitely uh, reduce drawdown and try to uh, yeah at least be somewhat uh, market neutral but you will always have a correlation with uh, the biggest cryptocurrencies even though if you try to um, diversify into other uh, cryptocurrencies because the market is just so correlated and there are few short uh, options available like f short um, assets available on the market and about the question regarding um, if you should choose a broker or um, sh should just do it um, directly yeah it probably depends on the case that you see uh, if you are an investor you can of course just go long and buy and hold um, if you have a very long time horizon i think this is gonna turn out well i guess we don't need to talk about our uh our view of the crypto markets, we are probably all bullish here. Otherwise we wouldn't really uh, sit here and work in this field. Um, but if you wanna be a little more cautious, you could go to uh, a fund like, yeah, Thomas's uh, fund, where they also um, try to reduce your downside potential and hopefully also introduce hedging when, when it becomes more widely av available. Mm -hmm. Uh, Christian, would you like to add something on this question? Yeah. That, that, <clears throat> sorry, there's a very interesting element in that question, um, especially with regard to brokers. Um, when you speak about cryptocurrencies, blockchain, it's all about this intermediation, right? And how quickly is the broker actually erased from that landscape, right? We don't need a broker. We can directly open our, our account on the exchange. Yeah, of course you can. But I want to point out that uh, a broker also in the current system is performing two major roles that are, in my opinion, are vital uh, to the market and will mainly drive actually um, the evolution of cryptocurrencies as well. The first one is price discovery, okay? I mean, of course, you can directly um, open your trading account on Börse Stuttgart. That's, that's true, right? Um, then you have the full counterparty risk of versus Stuttgart, which is, I believe, acceptable. But brokers also um, providing price discovery. There might be a better price on another exchange, okay? And uh, as an institutional investor, you want to be executed for the best price and, of course, taking into account the liquidity in the order books. So brokers actually, by connecting different trading venues and analyzing the order book depths, but also prices across exchanges, allow you to discover the best price being available on the market, okay, and execute for the best price. The other point is um, brokers are providing liquidity, okay. 
Um, and I think this is really important, especially for institutional investors. The way it currently works is when you want to buy Bitcoin, you have to deposit your fiat account with the exchange first. That can easily take up to one day, but you want to buy now, right? Because you believe the price to be good at the very moment. But now you have to deposit your money into the exchange account first, which can take up to a day. The price has already moved. And um, with the fiat money sit sitting on that exchange, you have the full counterparty risk in your books of that exchange, okay? And I think brokers can actually make the trading experience and the way that institutional investors are already used to trading, um, they can make that better by providing exactly that liquidity. Instead of depositing the money first, you can borrow the money from the broker, execute the trade, and then the settlement process will happen after the trade, okay? That means you already have a confirmed Bitcoin price, and this is exactly the price that, that you bought the Bitcoin for, and then the fiat settlement with the broker as your fully regulated and supervised counterparty happens afterwards. That significantly reduces the counterparty risk for institutional clients, but also um, allows that highly required liquidity being available to institutional clients. And this is why I believe brokers to be highly relevant um, for the still very, um, a young market, um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, Chris, and, you can, and you can see that also, I mean, uh, in, in the traditional markets, right? Like, I mean, uh, prime services are everywhere, right? So it's not like this has been, uh, this is sort of just applicable to a young market like, like crypto, but like, you know, progress will always be around. Um, I think there, there is space obviously for direct uh, exchange trading, um, but we are obviously as, as brothers too kind of happy to work with brokers such as yourself and others. Uh, it's always my, my opinion that like the, the investor chooses or should choose where to put his money, where to deploy his money. And like if, um, uh, as a, if a trading venue can't kind of get the best price, like, you know, they're happy to go somewhere else. And like, I think this is something that as a, as a, as a market, this is good for the entire market. Like the more, the more liquidity and lubrication we can bring to like, the crypto market, the better it is, right? So uh, it helps all of us. But by Christian, you, you said that one function of a broker is price discovery. This would only be a, uh, like a function which is valid in case there are inefficiencies in the market. Can you see such inefficiencies? Well, I guess yes. But how large are these inefficiencies? And if, the, if, there, if, they, if there are any inefficiencies, inefficiencies, why would you, Christian, not be a hedge fund uh, just exploiting these inefficiencies? Yeah, I believe, first of all, Thomas, to be exactly the right person to answer that. But however, I, I give it a try. Um, we see, and it really depends on the market um, timing and the volatility in the market. We still see spreads even for highly liquid um, pairs such as Bitcoin USD, okay? But that depends on the volatility. The higher the volatility is, the higher the spreads are. You can still, I mean, do a small arbitrage spread on that, but it's not really worth investing a lot of money into it because we anyway believe those arbitrage spreads with more prof professional investors, more liquidity entering the market to vanish. Uh, for smaller illiquid pairs, you still see significant um, arbitrage spreads of even a few percentage. Um, however, um, that is nice when you want to trade 10,000 euros or 20 or even 100k, but deploy, but try to deploy 1 million for those pairs. Uh, you then end up affecting the markets and cause the spreads to disappear by actually providing the liquidity. So, uh, of course, I mean, the market is for some asset, uh, for some pairs is already efficient and works. For other um, smaller pairs, it's highly inefficient. And this is why you have spreads. Okay. Thomas, you want to add something? Yeah. Um, so basically we spent a lot of our research time basically looking into inefficiencies in cryptocurrency markets. And as Christian said, um, there are a lot of short-term inefficiencies that are, um, well, that can be exploited, but you cannot put a lot of volume through this. On the other hand, uh, what's interesting also about cryptocurrency markets, even though they are only like 10 years, around 10 years, um, you know, we have data, basically only 10 year data. Um, what you see is that there are some patterns that are probably related or caused by uh, difficulty uh, or let's say the, the block reward halving, basically, as we see in Bitcoin every four years, that kind of triggers some statistical dependencies down the road that lead to 
repeating patterns over a longer time frame. So I would also, let's say, call them inefficiencies, even though they are not like statistical reversion to the mean arbitrage, whatever kind of uh, um, inefficiencies that we also like to exploit. But uh, there's a lot more volume actually that, uh, that you can put through longer term inefficiencies that are caused by human nature, for example. You have a lot of you know, human psychology involved in this and the human psychology is involved, inherently involved in causing like um, patterns, um, you know, that signify like, like panic or greed or you know, hype, whatever behavior and such inefficiency make it possible to put a lot of volume actually through this. So um, the short answer, short-term inefficiency, yes, there are, but not that much volume you can put through. Long-term inefficiencies, there are as well. And you can put a lot of volume through this, like a lot more than you need. Okay. Um, uh, another question I, I just uh, read in the, in the chat um, on the WhatsApp channel um, on this panel here. Um, this question, I think, is also nicely answered by Christian. And the question is, don't brokers also have other services as well, which are important, for example, um, IT integration, reporting, um, APIs, which are offered uh, to multiple uh, connected parties and so on. How important is this besides price discovery and what you previously mentioned? I, I think this is a must have. I mean, if a broker, for example, does not have the right infrastructure in order to interact with other market participants. Um, uh, I think there's, there, 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 there's no point in doing sustainably business, right? Um, I, I rather see that as a commodity and must have. Um, and still it works. I mean, the existing formats such as FIX that, that are already being used for interacting uh, with brokers, swift messages for um, exchanging uh, settlement instructions. Um, the, the, that's, that's only a technical question. I think a lot of those standards can be reused, okay? Um, at least when interacting with institutional clients. And mm -hmm. uh, of course, I mean, that, that makes it easier to interact because you can, in best case, use the same standards. They just have to uh, somehow upgrade their backend, right? The interaction with exchanges because that's completely new. Okay. Uh, you are not a broker, but which brokers could you recommend uh, if there are any in, in, in Germany or in Europe? In, <clears throat> there's, there's one broker that you might um, saw the press announcement. Bankau Scheich is now offering um, as a counterparty trading crypto uh, currencies. Um, there are a few more to come, definitely. Um, because, I mean, they're all, they're all facing their customer demand. And they can either take that business or allow their clients to trade elsewhere, right? Steich is, is one that we see in Germany. Uh, you've got a few Swiss brokers, of course, uh, but there's also an option to directly open your account with BSDX. So, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, uh, yeah. And Max, another question for you uh, coming here from the, uh, from the chat. Um, if there is so much uh, market uh, manipulation out there, so many inefficiencies and so on, um, how does, uh, is this conflicting with current regulation or how is this being done at your trading venue and also at how is this uh, being handled at other trading venues? Well, I think the, the, the short answer is at many other trading venues it's not handled uh, precisely to the point what Christian mentioned, you see a lot of fake orders being placed and a lot of uh, wash trading happening. Um, with, with us, we have, we have extremely strict rules that we are complying to to have a clean order book. Um, and to comply with regulations. Um, I mean, we are fully uh, made and based in Germany, so we have to fully comply to, to local regulations and, and make sure that like what you see in our order book is true volume and is, is executable flow, right? So, and um, we have to adhere to the rules that like um, our, our license partner BWWB uh, imposes on us. And that's very, very important to us. It's a Börse Stuttgart uh, group uh, uh, based company. And like we are, you know, if, if, if we're not, if we're not adhering to these rules, then, then no one will. Right. And in, in our opinion, this is, this is the key missing link to, um, to why a lot of like big name institutions haven't entered the market yet. And the big one is a reputational risk, right? Because, you know, if you as a, as a, you know, big name institution, uh, start trading these assets and realize that like, you know, 
your your end customers are not getting the prices that are that, that are visible or like the, you know fake order volumes are being placed this is something that will really hurt the market so this is why we are really adhering to the rules here and we can only um you know uh, encourage every other exchange to do the same because this is just good for the ecosystem okay interesting thought um excellent um i and the final question would be now uh, moving towards 10 o'clock uh, this morning what about the correlation to traditional securities markets uh, some people argue that there is no correlation between bitcoin and say s p others are saying the correlation is very high especially during the corona drawdown Uh, what is the truth here? Uh, who wants to take this question? Um, Jan, can you say something about this? Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, well, I mean, if you look at the numbers, uh, there is definitely a positive correlation. It's definitely not negative. So you don't have a negative beta or anything like this uh, in relation to the S&P 500. In the, the Corona crisis, the correlation was for a short time very high. Um, yeah. So if you just look at the numbers, you know, you cannot uh, deny that there is uh, a correla correlation. I think it also depends on the uh, on the time frame that you're looking at. Are you looking at uh, the time since 2014 or 13, or are you looking just at the last two or three years? Um, I'm, I'm not exactly sure how this is going to change, but I think you, you should take really into account what time frame you, uh, you use. Um, so yeah especially in these liquidity crunches like we have seen recently um i think um yeah crypto will will also be affected by that and in the future we will probably see this again um we also see this in gold for example for short uh, periods of time um and i don't really think that we will get to like a negative correlation anytime anytime i don't see a case for that thomas would you would you agree on this um, okay, so um, fu fully agree looking at the numbers. Um, the, the only thing, but that's just personal opinion, is that uh, Bitcoin in the past was quite good at surprising people. And um, a positive correlation basically that builds up, um, which is unde undeniably there, um, might also lead people to believe that it will go on like this forever, maybe. So I can also think of scenarios where, you know, where, um, it decouples and surprises people and a lot of people end up on the wrong side of the trade. I, I don't know. So um, as Jan said, basically, um, depending on the time frame, um, we have a strong positive correlation currently. And, and that's like the facts. That's the numbers. I, I just would be, want, would, personally, I'm careful about the correlation. Okay. Thanks. Uh, so, you know, the analysis I did myself shows clearly that it's a matter of the time frame. So uh, depending on what, when are you exactly uh, computing the correlation uh, coefficient and what is basically the number of days which are going into the computation, then you get out whatever you want to. You can get a very high correlation coefficients uh, out there, uh, especially in the corona drawdown, and you get a correlation coefficient close to zero uh, when you are having other time periods which you are considering. I would expect, and with this, I would like to close this round, that we will see an, a moderate po positive correlation for the upcoming years. And, the question, and the, the question is, why would I expect this? Because we see inflation happening. And if inflation happening, we see all kinds of real assets, Bitcoin stocks uh, moving upwards. Uh, and of course, then you would have a, at least a moderate a positive correlation. That's what I would expect for the upcoming years. Uh, but let's let's see what uh, what really turns out to be in the future. Anybody wants to make a closing word for this morning? No. Well, thank you very thank you very much, Philip, for yeah, organizing this. Uh, I'm, I mean, as a closing word, I'm happy that like institutional, that I, I keep seeing more institutional demand, but also these panels happening because I think it's it's absolutely required for for the uh, the crypto industry to thrive. If we don't see like significant institutional capital entering the market, like this is uh, no good news. But um, I think we're we're on great track here, and I look forward to more of these. Excellent, thank, thank you. I thank think you the Philip. demand is there, and the demand is increasing. But if you look at the real numbers uh, in Germany, we can see that there is hardly any institutional uh, money flowing into crypto. But it's very very strongly different uh, in, in Switzerland. Okay, thank you very much, and then uh, have a very nice. Tuesday and a very nice rest of the week. Yeah, thanks.